We'll just wait one more minute here because people are still showing up. So Emily, are you all ready to go? I'll have Ramon introduce you in just a minute. Yep. All right. Okay, well, welcome everybody to uh, our special uh, student extravaganza colloquium session for fall 2020. Um, we're really pleased to have three of our senior graduate students give uh, short but awesome presentations, no pressure. Um, and uh, Ramon will introduce uh, the first of our three students um, in just a minute. Uh, just one quick announcement, uh, a reminder uh, that Earth and Space Exploration Day uh, is happening. Um, it's going virtual, it's going digital, like everything else in the world. Um, October 24th in the morning. That's about all that I know. Ramon might have a bit more details. I don't know about uh, what's what's being planned, um, but it should be uh, good, interactive, safe, fun, I guess, one way or another. Um, so with that, I'm happy to turn this over to Ramon to introduce Emily. And and I'll try to keep time, Emily. Um, uh, there's no easy way, I don't think, for me to tell to... Well, I'll, I'm going to turn off my camera so you won't see me. I'll pop in again when when you have uh, just a couple minutes left. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. Okay, uh, yeah. Um, just a quick thing on Earth and Space Exploration Day. There's a little bit on the CC website under public engagement, and it's uh, it's going to be held virtually starting at 10 a.m. and it'll feature demonstrations, talks with scientists, and science activities. So I think it's you know stay tuned for more details, but uh, should be really fun event and quite accessible online. Uh, so today I'm really uh, pleased uh, to introduce Emily Zawacki to everybody. Uh, she's a senior PhD student working with me and also co-advised with uh, Professor Chris Campisano from the School of Human Evolution and Social Change. She came to us uh, from Lawrence University where she has an undergraduate degree in geology and Spanish. Uh, and she uh, has done many things while she's been here uh, in CC, and what, one notable thing was that she published her the outcome of her second project for her qualifying exam for a PhD. She worked on with Professor Amanda Clark reconstructing an eruption, uh, a volcanic eruption uh, in the Pinacate volcanic field in northern Sonora, just south of the border of Mexico, and so she was able to use her Spanish. Uh, she's worked very hard on this primary project that she's going to talk to you about, and um, really appreciate that work. Very integrative of um, analysis of the sedimentary basins of East Africa with um, thinking about volcano volcanology and tectonics. And I'll just say, you know, she's uh, famous uh, in the uh, public sphere for her, her Twitter handle is she's the Zawakinator. So please take it away. All right. Thanks, Ramon. Get this started. All right, so today I'm going to be talking about the detrital zircon record of the East African Rift System from Hominin Sites and Paley Lakes Drilling Project, or HSPDP drill cores. So the East African Rift System, or the EARS, is a region of active continental rifting. It extends for over 3,000 kilometers from the Afar Triple Junction, where it meets with two other divergent margins, all the way down to Mozambique. It's divided into the western branch, where there is only isolated volcanism, and then the eastern branch, which will be the focus of this talk, where there is voluminous volcanism. Pre-rift volcanism initiated around 45 million years ago and has continued to the present. And active rifting began about 25 million years ago. So of course this is very interesting purely from a geological standpoint, but the ears is also very interesting uh, via a paleoanthropological perspective, because this combination of tectonism, volcanism, and subsequent sedimentation has produced a series of rift basins that contain a rich paleoanthropological record. So we have an area that has high preservation and also lots of material that's suitable for dating. Um, so there's about a six million year old record of hominin evolution. And so there's lots of research that focuses on understanding the paleo environment and understanding the geology of the East African rift from this perspective. So the project that I'm a part of and that my PhD constitutes is the Hominin Sites and Paleo Lakes Drilling Project, or HSPDP, location shown by the red dots on this map. 
the project collected about 2,000 meters of paleolake sediments from near six key paleoanthropological sites in Ethiopia and Kenya. The project as a whole seeks to understand the relationship between Earth system history and human evolution by combining together multiple proxies and producing a high resolution geological and environmental record. One of my components of the project is to look at the detrital zircon record. So this is quite a step away from the hominins themselves and kind of more purely looking at the geology of the region. And I'm looking to be able to answer questions like, what is the provenance of the sediments in the drill cores? Where are they eroding from in the landscape? What does that tell us about changes in the paleo landscapes and paleo hydrology over time? And then also, how well does the detrital record capture the timing of East African Rift volcanotectonic activity? So I'm working with the mineral zircon, which is a common accessory mineral in igneous rocks. You'll find it in plutonic rocks, such as granites and gneisses. And there are also volcanic zircons. So you'll find that typically um, in silicic volcanic eruptions, it's very rare to find it associated with basaltic eruptions. And there's a lot of really cool things that you can do with zircons. One of the main great things you can do is you can date them. So here at ASU, we get to do something pretty cool called single crystal laser ablation double dating. So using systematics of um, isotopes and radioactive decay, we are able to date both a uranium lead date and a uranium thorium helium date of a single zircon. So our uranium lead has a high closure temperature and that captures the crystallization age of our zircon. Then at the same time, we're able to measure our much colder uranium thorium helium age, which for a plutonic zircon would represent a cooling age related to exhumation and would represent the eruption age for a volcanic zircon. So in my work, we can look at and create double dating plots where we plot this cooling age versus our crystallization age. And we can use our uranium lead crystallization age of our detrital zircons as a way to tie it and compare it back to the bedrock from which it was eroded. So we can see our ages match about 75 million years. And we compare that and we can tell it's coming from this bedrock source. Then we can also see we have a thermal history. So terrain A is volcanic, so it falls along this one-to-one -one line since cooling is essentially instantaneous. And we have other um, plutonic, more slowly cooled terrains. So I'll be talking about just two of the HSPDP drill sites. The Northern Awash site located in the Afar region of Ethiopia. The core here spans about 3.3 to 2.9 million years. And the West Turkana site located in Northern Kenya. And that core spans about 1.9 to 1.4 million years. These sites are located within the large modern day drainage basins of the Awash and the Omo River. So with our zircons, we can have compare and see how these basins may have evolved and changed over time. I was able to collect uh, four samples total from the Northern Awash cores. This shows the core stratigraphy. There are two cores taken about three kilometers apart from each other that are stratigraphically tied together. And based on the core age range, these sediments are representative of the well-known Hadar formation. We were only able to get one sample from the West Turkana core, since these are primarily lacustrine cores and we're looking for sandier intervals. And the sample that I'm working with was dated via argon-argon dating to about 1.5 million years. Now, unfortunately, I wasn't able to go to East Africa or do any work in the field associated with the drilling, but I did get to travel to the University of Minnesota where they have LACCOR, the National Lacustrine Core Facilities, where I got to sample from the collected drill cores. So this is what our drill cores look like. They're typically in two meter drives. Uh, they're sliced in half, so we get to work with the working half. Um, and then I'm working with these sand sediments. So this is um, what it looks like under a microscope. And especially in this sample, it's very heavily volcanoclastic, lots of little basalt bits. So I need to work to be able to get just the zircon grains out of this sample. So the samples are first wet sieved, so we can isolate a fine sand size fraction. And that typically involves quite a number of hours spent in a very cold lab um, picking sifts because we can't have any contamination between samples. We then put our sample through a series of magnetic separations so that we can get to a non-magnetic fraction which will contain our zircons. That then goes through density separations using LST heavy liquids. Zircon is a heavy mineral so that sinks out. And then you can see uh, in our under our scope we've got some nice zircons here. 
along with other stuff that we're not interested in. So we just pick out the zircons and then we individually mount and line up a total of 110 grains. We create and polish our mount and then we're ready to analyze. So first we ablate a small pit for helium analyses using gas source mass spectrometry. And then you can see we have a large pit that's ablated here um, using the ICPMS for uranium, thorium, and lead measurements. So we can first start by looking at my detrital zircon uranium lead results for the northern Awash samples. So th these are plots of cumulative probability density functions showing the ages of all the grains. So as we can see here, all of the ages are younger than 45 million years old, which indicates that all of these zircons are volcanic zircons derived from silicic volcanic rocks associated with the East African Rift system. We notably do have a quite large gap covering a span of um, close to uh, 10 million years, uh, where we only have a single dated grain of that age. And then we have three of our samples, and the youngest zircons are consistent with deposition around 2.9 million years, which is kind of what we assumed and was consistent for the cores. However, this uppermost sample here yielded grains that were as young as 1.7 million years. And we also have a slightly different larger age peak at about three and a half million years. Um, so what that indicates to us is that this upper sample from this NAW core actually samples from above a major regional, regional unconformity. So at 2.9 million years ago, there was a major regional unconformity that separates what's known as the Hadar formation from the Busudima formation. So our zircons let us know that this upper sample is actually over a million years younger than these other samples and is part of the, this uh, earlier formation. By comparison, we can look at our one sample from West Turkana, and this sample does actually yield Precambrian aged zircons. So these are derived from bedrock or associated sandstone. Otherwise, we do have a lot of zircons that are consistent with all the Northern Awash ages, so Cenozoic volcanic zircons. And this sample is dominated by an age peak at about 1.6 million years, um, which is active volcanism just prior to the deposition. And so this age is our uranium lead crystallization age. So we can see that there's a 100,000 year offset between that crystallization age and this argon-argon eruption age. Then we can move on to looking at our double dating plots, looking at our helium age versus our uranium lead age. So we have our one-to-one -one line drawn in where we'd expect to see our volcanic grains fall onto having a short lag time from crystallization to eruption. However, what we see in all of these samples is that there's a really wide range in helium ages for a same given uranium lead age. And in fact, for all of these samples, we have helium ages that are younger than the depositional age. So what we see is this very widespread in helium ages that's indicative of partial resetting since this is a dynamic active rift likely due to either heating from the salt flows or hydrothermal alteration. Similarly, our West Turkana sample shows very um, similar patterns, albeit it does have more grains that do fall along the one-to-one -one line, although this sample also does have helium ages that are younger than the depositional age. Then we can look at our Precambrian age zircons, which are derived from bad rock, which should have slow cooling, and so we do have a number of grains that have ages that are consistent with bedrock cooling ages. But even here, we have zircon helium ages that are as young as 1 million years old. So that indicates that even after the deposition of these sediments, there has to be some sort of partial resetting that's heating them um, to yield such young ages. Then we can move on to tie these uranium lead ages to the bedrock from where they're likely being eroded from. So our Precambrian aged grains from West Turkana are likely derived from this Lepur range shown on the inset here. And there's very few exposures of Precambrian aged units or sandstones that are correlative. Um, and so this is actually quite proximal to our drill site. And in fact, the majority of these zircons from West Turkana are also derived from units that either overlie the Lepur range or are in the very near vicinity. So we're getting quite proximal sediment sourcing um, for our West Turkana site. Then for Northern two, Awash, we have our oldest minutes. grit, which are about 40 million years old. And so that's derived from this Amaro-Gamo unit. 
which as we can see is south of our modern day drainage basin. So that means that there had to be more connectivity between the systems to get grains of that age. You then have grains about 30 million years that are coming from this western Ethiopian plateau. Um, and then we're going to see even more material coming from this western edge um, with grains about 26 million years coming from Dessie series. Our major age peak coming from the Chifra and Finto formations. And then our younger grains are from a stratoid series, which are from encompassing um, the majority of the Afar Depression. And what we see with this shift to um, a bigger age peak in the, our upper sample shows that there is a shift after the unconformity to more localized reworking as opposed to all material from the western margin. Then finally, we can compare our data to various established periods of volcanic phases in East African Rift history. So although autotidal zircon record only represents silicic activity and there's a lot of basaltic activity, um, the record tracks very well with the timing of established phases. However, we notably do not have anything representative aside for a single grain of this flood phonolites and silicic eruptive phase. Being a silicic phase, we should see zircons. And so the fact that we don't is, indic is indicative of watershed boundaries where that material is not being delivered to our drill sites. We can kind of end by looking at a schematic of what our zircons in the East African Rift system are going through. We see them primarily coming from silicic volcanism um, and associated chaffer deposits with a few coming from basement rocks. So these zircons are transported to the fluvial system where they'll be subject to hydrothermal alteration or heating from basalt flows. And then they'll be deposited and captured by our lake cores where there is also subsequent hydrothermal alteration. So to conclude, our detrital zircon record of the major watersheds within the East African Rift system are dominated by volcanic zircons that are produced by silicic volcanism associated with the development of the gears. We see the western Afar margin is the predominant sedimentary source for these northern Awash samples. And we have a record that tracks well with established volcanic phases with gaps due to differences in watershed configurations. And this widespread that we see in helium ages is reflective of this dynamic nature of heating within the rift environment. So thank you to my advisors, my collaborators and co-authors and my committee members. Thank you very much. Um, we didn't talk about how we're going to handle questions, but I think we should do questions right after each presentation if people have questions in the audience um, while ideas are fresh. So if you have any questions, feel free to uh, type them into the Q&A. Um, or if you want to raise your hand, I'm happy to uh, call on you and turn on your mic. Yes, you're getting some virtual applause in the chat. Uh, all right, we're getting some questions. Uh, Megan Bromley asks, how are the cores determined to be representative of their environments? So these are primarily lacustrine cores. So we have paleo lakes that are accumulating sediment. They're accumulating um, paleo vegetation signals. So there's lots of people that study um, leaf wax biomarkers. We can look at microfossils in the core. Um, diatoms in the lake. Um, so we have lots of indications um, in our environmental record of what the paleoclimate may have been like, what the vegetation may have been like, what animals may have lived in the region, and then my work kind of expands farther back into looking at what's kind of going on in this large scale um, in the landscape systems. Great. And Everett Schock asks, how do your results relate to the paleoanthropology story? Yes. So my results are really kind of more purely the geologic context, um, but it's helpful in terms of understanding um, important shifts in the environment. So we know that there is a major unconformity um, and we see a shift in where our erosion, erosional material is coming from. So that's at least telling us that there are changes in the environment, um, which is useful in, uh, for paleoanthropologists who then put to the test various different theories of evolution, whether it be um, variability selection um, due to um, there's belief that if the environment is highly variable um, 
or versus a pure drying trend. Um, so I'm a few steps away from the hominins themselves, but. Great. So we have some other questions, but in the interest of time, I think we're going to have to move on. So uh, thank you, Emily. That was lovely. I'm going to promote Kellen to panelists here so that he can introduce our next speaker. Thank you again, Emily, for doing this. It was great. Kellen, you should be able to turn on your microphone and your camera. All right, let's see how it works. Hey, there he is, right. Professor Whipple himself. There I am, not completely technology uh, limited here. Um, that was great, Emily. Thanks a lot of information in a short time. That was, that was very nicely done. All right, so it's my pleasure to introduce our next speaker, Ren Raming. So Ren came to us from the University of Utah in 2016. Um, yeah, I'll just mention he followed an unusual path. So Ren started as an economics major. And about the time he finished up in economics, he started working as a river guide in the Grand Canyon back in about 2007. And working there, he really just fell in love with geology and the problem of river incision and uh, canyon carving, as most people do that spend any time in the Grand Canyon. So Ren decided to return to the University of Utah, and he got a geology degree with a minor in physics. So he's a multi-talented guy. He's married with a wonderful wife. He's got two very active young boys, and he's got a great story to tell you on uh, thresholds and limits on river incision, how climate is recorded by rivers in the Hawaiian Islands. So let me hand it off to Ren. All right, uh, wonderful. Thanks, Kellen. I'm gonna set my screen uh, so everybody can see it. Um, See, actually, a second. Sorry, I'm gonna pull up PowerPoint. Okay, great, wonderful. Well, thank you for the in introduction, Kellen. I appreciate that, and uh, thanks everybody for uh, giving me the opportunity uh, to share what I've been working on here at CC for the past uh, couple of years. And so, um, yeah, today's talk I'm gonna be talking about uh, thresholds and limits on river incision and how climate is recorded by rivers on the Hawaiian Islands. And so Hawaii uh, presents an ideal natural experiment for understanding how climate drives river incision. So here's a figure of uh, mean annual rainfall for the state of Hawaii. And you can see there's quite a wide range of climate. So this uh, red colors reflect uh, dry climate. And you can see that, that it's uh, relatively low uh, mean annual rainfall rates. In fact, it's comparable to the rainfall that we observe here in Arizona. And then on the other side, on the wet side of the islands, we can see um, really high rates of rainfall. In fact, it's some of the highest rainfall rates on the earth. And so on places like Hawaii and on places like Maui, uh, we can see rainfall rates in excess of 10 meters per year. And so in addition to that, <clears throat> we can also see that uh, there's a wide range of ages, ages for the islands. So Kauai, is one of the oldest islands, it's about 5 million years old, and it's up here in the northern part. And then we have ongoing shield building all the way down here in the southern part uh, uh, by the big island of Hawaii. And so uh, these conditions are ideal for understanding how climate drives river incision. And this is uh, paired with the fact that um, preserved initial conditions are widespread on the islands. So here's a 3D model of West Maui. And you can see that West Maui has these uh, 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 well-preserved surfaces on parts of the island. And so we can use these uh, preserved surfaces to reconstruct the initial topography of the shield volcano. And from that, we can get uh, a 3D model of the erosion and incision of uh, those canyons. And you can see that basically on West Maui, you have some massive canyons that have carved into the middle of the edifice here. And some of them are up to a kilometer deep. So there's these really big, uh, deeply incised canyons. And that's compared to some of the other canyons, or they're not even canyons, they're more valleys, but they have minimal incision. So we're talking on the order of tens of, meter, tens of meters. So there's a wide range of uh, response uh, in terms of uh, the influence of climate to driving river incision. And importantly, you can see that river incision really shapes this landscape and really kind of drives uh, how the landscape evolves in time. And so uh, we're not the first to have noticed this, of course, and there's been a lot of work uh, focused on this problem in Hawaii. 
And there's been some high impact work that has come out over the past decade or so. So this, uh, this uh, paper by Ferrier et al. Um, focuses on uh, basically how climate controls bedrock river incision on the island of Kauai. And they highlight that basically mean annual precipitation is one of the major controls on uh, your river incision rate. And that was followed by another paper by Murphy et al. where they focus on chemical weathering as a me mechanism for uh, climate control on bedrock river incision. So they basically showed how weathering limits the strength of the bedrock and, and in turn also influences the incision rate. So the key point is that the majority of studies focused on river incision has focused on how climate uh, influences river incision rates on the Hawaiian Islands. And so all this work has predominantly been framed in the, uh, in the basis of uh, stream power. So stream power is the capacity of a river to work on the surrounding landscape. So here is the equation for stream power and you can see stream power is represented by the variable omega and it's going to be equal to the specific weight of water times the discharge uh, and times the channel gradient. And so just to note, I use uh, channel and stream and river interchange. Uh, uh, I interchange those. So uh, if I confuse you uh, with channel, just know I'm talking about rivers. Um, and then same here, you can see uh, on the bottom here, we have the channel width. So that's our stream power and we can simplify that even more and we get this little Q term, which is basically gonna be our discharge per unit width. So it's just gonna be Q, big Q divided by our channel width. And then DZ, DX is going to be the gradient of our channel. So one of the things that people have proposed um, in terms of trying to understand how uh, rivers incise bedrock and their influence on landscape evolution is that the incision rate should be proportional to the stream power model or sorry, to stream power. And that's how we uh, obtain the stream power uh, incision model. And so the incision rate here is uh, dz dt, and that's gonna be equal to our rate coefficient k times our stream power raised to an exponent a. And so a is just, in our case here, is just gonna be equal to one. But the important thing to note is that the stream power, oh, oh also importantly, um, the previous work is predominantly focused on how climate has influenced this rate coefficient k. Um, so that's been the primary focus. And it's worth noting that the stream power model is uh, typically applied and tested in tectonic settings uh, where uplift balances incision and signals of river incision thresholds can be obscured. So in a lot of this work, uh, the possibility of a threshold for river incision has been sort of uh, ignored. And so we're gonna argue that it actually plays an important uh, role. And so the first uh, line of evidence for that is that uh, uplift in Hawaii is minimal and only sustained for a geologically short time. So without uplift and without a threshold, uh, we can't really recreate realistic stream profiles. So here I'm gonna show you a simple 1D stream power model. And the uh, red line is gonna be the, the stream profile as it evolves through time. And the blue is showing your initial conditions. And so you can see basically that the stream cuts down to a, a gradient of zero. And so that's unrealistic. And so basically to incorporate the role of a threshold, we introduce this threshold term, which is psi. And so this is going to be basically the threshold stream power that needs to be sort of exceeded in order to begin um, incising the bedrock. And so once we incorporate that into our model, we can see uh, we get a realistic profile with the stream profile is concave up and the gradient of the channel increases as we move, move towards the headwaters. And so um, we can compare that to uh, what we observe on Hawaii. And so we can see that's actually representative of a channel profile we observe in Hawaii. So that's one important line of evidence uh, that thresholds are prevalent on the Hawaiian Islands. The second one is that uh, there's geological evidence that suggests early and rapid formation of canyons as followed by the by a state of quiescence. So here's a hillshade of the northern edge of Kauai and the stars are showing radiometric uh, ages of the shield of Kauai and so Kauai dates back to about five to four million years in age and that's when uh, it's the main shield building stage ended but after that it uh, 
uh, eroded and um, began, and the streams began to incise. And you can see that there's some big canyons that have cut into the shield. And in this canyon, you can see this purple surface, and this purple surface actually represents a uh, rejuvenated uh, volcanics that have been deposited in the bottom of this canyon, and they date back to about 2.6 million years ago. So um, that's evidence that this canyon, these canyons formed uh, relatively early and have been inactive since. And we even see evidence for that on some of the younger islands. So this is uh, the, from the Kohala, Kohala Peninsula on the big island of Hawaii. And so the peninsula dates back in, in, uh, to about 0 0.7 to 0 0.4 a million years ago in age. But you can see this blue surface here is showing a post uh, shield building flow you can see that it's flowed into this canyon and it dates back to about 0 0.15 million years ago. So this canyon must have cut within that time period and, and presumably part of this canyon as well and has been uh, relatively inactive since. So that's the second line of evidence uh, that thresholds are important on Hawaii. And our third is basically just comes from field observations. So uh, if you go to a stream in Hawaii, be prepared to be uh, climbing over these massive boulders. And so this photo on the left is showing uh, one of the uh, stream on Molokai, and you can see that's filled with these massive boulders. And so we know these boulders act as an effective threshold on river incision. That is, there's only a certain range of floods that can actually begin to move these boulders and size the bedrock underneath. And the second thing that's important to note is that uh, we can look at outcrops of the basalt um, from shield building, we can see that there's these thick bands of aa. Uh -uh. So this is a, a band of aa uh -uh that's about two meters thick. And so this provides the source of these large boulders. And so basically the size of our threshold is gonna be dependent on the thickness of these aa -uh flows and the prevalence of them. And we expect that these, uh, basically that this shouldn't vary too much between islands. And as a result, uh, we should have a relatively uniform threshold. And so with that uh, background, we asked the question, if channels are at a threshold state, how is climate recorded in the topography? And so to start with that question, uh, or, or to provide an answer to that question, one of the first things we have to address is the fact that variation in river discharge limits direct comparison between stream profiles. So one way we can uh, address that is by normalizing for this variation in discharge. And to do that, we're going to start once again with our uh, stream power model framework. And we're going to start at a threshold state, which is represented by this equation here. So the gradient of the channel, dz dx, is going to be equal to this ratio here, which is going to be our, uh, our threshold stream power psi uh, on the, in the numerator and our uh, unit discharge or discharge per, cha per channel width um, and the denominator. And so uh, gamma, once again, is just the specific weight of water, which would be a constant. So we can separa separate the variables and integrate both sides with respect to x, and we obtain this equation here. And so you'll note that this is actually a, uh, or you can note that this is actually an equation for a line. And so basically, we have the elevation of the uh, stream profile z as a function of x, which is the distance uh, along the stream uh, from the outlet to the channel head. Z naught is gonna be the elevation of the stream channel at the outlet. And then this term here is gonna be the slope of our line, but importantly, you can see that that's, uh, the slope of the line is gonna reflect our threshold stream power. And then basically, uh, it's, uh, we're gonna be plotting against this chi term. And so chi is basically the inverse uh, unit discharge integrated from the uh, outlet of the stream to any point along the stream. So that's how we can calculate chi. But one of the challenges with chi is that it's hard to measure uh, Q directly. So um, in lieu of that, we can actually ap approximate chi as drainage area weighted by mean annual rainfall. So that provides a good estimate. So in that case, we can use this uh, variable chi p, which is the same sort of integral, but in this case, we're using drainage area as a function of uh, the distance along the stream um, times the rainfall as a function of distance along the stream. And that's raised to the one half to account for the how discharge, uh, how channel width changes with discharge. So the important thing to note though is we can measure- A minute, friend. Okay, the important thing to couple, note- couple minutes, good. Yep, good, thank you. Uh, we can measure elevation in Chi-P from the topography and obtain a linearized profile with a slope that provides an estimate of our threshold stream power. 
And so here's an example of that. And this is a little cartoon of two different stream profiles in normal space. And you can see they're concave up and the gradient changes uh, with distance. But once we uh, apply that transformation, we can see they become linear and we can infer from the slope uh, if there's a, if it's a relatively high threshold stream power or a low uh, threshold stream power. So we're gonna apply that analysis to uh, the island of Kauai. So we're gonna just look at a couple of select streams here uh, shown by these yellow uh, dashed lines. And you can see this is colored by mean annual rainfall. So it's gonna cover a wide range of climate. And so here are the stream profiles. And you can see that they, they reflect uh, basically a wide range of climate. So reflected in their color, a wide range of drainage area and channel gradient. And once we apply that linear transformation, um, we're counting for variation in drainage area and rainfall, we can see that they have similar slopes uh, in this section here, which implies they have a similar uh, threshold. And so this makes sense, um, as I pointed out earlier, uh, since there should be a limit on the boulder size set by the prevalence and thickness of those AA flows. And so we applied that analysis um, to several islands uh, uh, in Hawaii. And so uh, in this case, we plotted our results against a, uh, basically this is a normalized uh, uh, threshold stream power on the y-axis. And this, these are the islands we looked at. And we basically normalized the mean uh, with the mean threshold from Kauai, Molokai, and Maui. And you can see that basically there's little variation for the mean for the majority of these islands with the exception of these outliers here. And so basically uh, it's important to know that these are the youngest canyons and they're likely not at a threshold state. But in general, uh, the estimated uh, threshold stream power is plus or minus 20% variation from that mean. And so that's an important takeaway. And so with that, we can return to the question, how is climate recorded in the topography? So in this case, if our threshold is relatively constant and our gamma term obviously is constant as well, um, we can uh, see that wetter climates should produce a greater discharge. And as a result, we can expect a lower channel gradient. So the impact on the topography is gonna be reflected in the gradient of the stream profile. So here's a little cartoon of that. This is a dashed line is showing your initial, uh, initial uh, slope. And basically drier channels um, are gonna have steeper, are gonna be steeper, and you're gonna have less incision than a wet channel where you're gonna have a lower channel grain, so greater incision. So um, we can actually see that. Um, oh, well, importantly, that suggests that at th threshold conditions, topography records climates influence as maximum incision depth. And then basically when we uh, plot a corrected incision depth, so accounting for drainage area and rainfall against mean annual rainfall, we see this, which is pretty messy. But if we note Kohala could be in a transient state, then we see that there's more of an expected trend where uh, incision depth increases with mean annual rainfall. And so that's an important finding from our uh, work here. And then importantly, this also means that incision rates from threshold conditions have little mean. So basically, I plotted in the time average, average incision rate on the left axis against the age of the shield volcano on the right. And you can see that uh, the incision rates are correlated with time. And so this is uh, basically uh, represents the mean incision depth for all the canyons divided by time. But this is what we'd expect if incision happens rapidly and if we reach a threshold state early. So it's basically a Sadler type effect where we're incorporating longer hiatuses of uh, no incision. And so in conclusion, uh, Hawaii provides a clear example of where thresholds of uh, river incision are important. And thresholds, thresholds of river incision on Hawaii appear constant, thus climate is recorded in the landscape by setting the gradient of the channel, and as a result, the total incision depth. And, uh, and although uh, climate must influence incision rates, the topography cannot be used to recover these incision rates. And so thank you for your time. Uh, I appreciate uh, this opportunity very much. So. All right, well, congratulations. Another great talk. Very clear, um, very thorough. Um, Thank you. There's virtual applause building up in the chat. You can, you can, you can, you can sense it if you yeah, put I your hand on your keyboard. <laughs> yeah. uh, can you feel it? Um, and we, we have time for a quick question. Uh, Carver Bierson has a question. Uh, he, he says, great talk. You mentioned that tectonic settings can hide the sh thresholding behavior. Can you expand on why this is the case? Uh, yeah, I mean, in a sense, basically, uh, you can think about 
as a river in sizes, it's going to be removing material. But in, in, a, in a way, when you're uplifting the surrounding terrain, you're moving additional material um, for the stream to erode, right? So you can get a situation where the uplift of the channel, or, or basically the incision rates, the, the channels and sizing at a rate that is going to be equal to the uplift rate. And so um, in that case, it might be hard to tell where you know, what the influence of a threshold would be if uplift is, uh, or the tectonic signals are really dominant. So if there's significant uplift, and that's gonna be your dominant signal recorded by the uh, stream profile. All right, I'm, I'm gonna, there's one other question that came in that's just too interesting to not ask. Um, how does this influence our understanding of formation of other canyons such as the Grand Canyon or other planets? Yeah, well, that's an interesting question. Um, and so I should note that Hawaii's actually been a, a good planetary analog, so that's relevant for CC. Um, but I think, you know, I guess you, the important thing to know is that in most mountainous and, and steep terrains, you're going to have to deal uh, with moving some sort of sediment. And, and at, that's going to, in itself, just present some sort of threshold of stream power. So there's basically not all discharges are going to erode the bedrock. And so um, basically highlighting the importance of a threshold in a condition where the signal is clear is going to suggest that these other locations, um, it should also be acting and kind of points to the fact that we need to look at that. And, uh, you know, I was, I've been thinking about that in terms of the application to other uh, uh, planets, you know, and the, one of the things to think about is that um, new channels should be less steep, or, or, or I guess you could think about the threshold condition being dependent on gravity. Um, and so if they have a, a smaller uh, influence of gravity, you should have potentially a change in steepness of your channels. But um, yeah, so. All right. Yeah, thanks. Great, well, thank you again. And um, uh, we need to move on. Uh, so last but not least, definitely not least, is uh, Sierra Ferguson and Steve Desch is going to introduce Sierra. Hi. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, I'm really pleased to be able to introduce Sierra. Um, Sierra got her BS at uh, NAU in physics and astronomy and then came here to ASU to work with Alyssa Roden. Um, I don't know if any of you know, but after Alyssa Roden left two years ago, I uh, acquired all of her students. And um, I'm really pleased to have been um, working with Sierra. Uh, she, she embodies the spirit of CC interdisciplinarity, uh, working physics, astronomy, and now planetary science. She did an internship at Goddard Space Flight Center on Europa and uh, the JPL Planetary Science Summer School, uh, prototyping the mission to an interstellar comet. Uh, what she's talking about today is crater counting on Saturn satellites. And when I asked her what uh, interests her about this topic, she use words like she wants to know what's in Earth's uh, backyard and she uh, likes craters because they allow you to dig deeper. So I have this image of her out in the backyard as a kid digging in the dirt for uh, buried treasure and I'm excited to see what buried treasure she's discovered in Saturn satellites. So Sierra Ferguson. Awesome. Thank, thank you so much for the introduction, Steve. I'm going to get my screen share going and I want to thank the core fan committee for for inviting me to give this talk. I'm very excited to, to, to talk to you guys about this first chapter of my dissertation. So like Steve mentioned, I'm looking at the impact craters on Saturn's moon Tethys, and, and all of this information can be found in our recently published paper in, J, in JGR Planets. I'd also like to, of course, dedicate this talk to my, my late undergrad advisor, Dr. Nadine Barlow, who was my undergrad research advisor up at NAU and recently passed away. But, she got me into planetary science and cratering, so this is for her. So we're going, we're, we're going on quite a journey now from, from Africa and Hawaii all the way out to Saturn. So I wanted to give a brief overview of what's going on in the Saturn system. Saturn, as we all know, has all these gorgeous rings, but a lot of moons too. So for the purposes of, of the questions I'm asking in my dissertation work, I'm really, really con considering these, these inner satellites. So Mimas, which some people might know as the Death Star Moon, has a cool impact crater that when looked at the right angle, it, it does look like the Death Star. Then there's Enceladus, which is very familiar to a lot of people right now because it's an active ocean world that is constantly erupting water and other particles out of its south polar terrain. Then we have Tethys, which is the moon I'll be talking about today. One of the smaller satellites, but is also extremely low density. This, this moon has a density of like 0 
grams per centimeter cubed, which is incredibly low and implies that there's really not a lot of rock inside of this moon, which is puzzling in its own right, but that's, that's, a, that's a different talk for another, for another scientist. And then we have Dione and Rhea, which are, which are other, which are bigger satellites and likely also have more rock inside of them. But then out past where we have Titan, Hyperion, Iapetus, and Phoebe, but those aren't really of interest right now. But you can't, Saturn is pretty synonymous with these rings. But, and so I'm showing an image, a false color image from Voyager 2 and a close up of the rings from the Cassini, from the Cassini spacecraft. And so as the Cassini mission reached its sort of grand finale state back in 2017, we, the team was able to look and determine what the ring, what the mass of Saturn's rings was, which was, could, could not have been done until these final 22 orbits that put Cassini very close into Saturn and looping even through the rings, which is incredible orbit, orbit sequences. But this, this determination of the ring mass really ignited this question of how old are Saturn's rings? And so some, some scientists are saying that Saturn's rings are as, are as old as Saturn itself with four and a half billion years, or they could be as young as 100 million years old. So this 100 million year time frame could, would be, give or take, when dinosaurs were still roaming the Earth. But to understand what's going on with the rings, you first need to also know what happened to the moons and how these moons grew and evolved and, and, did, and did what they've done because the moons can have an influence on the rings. So just like our question of how old are the rings, a, recent, a paper in, back in 2016 ignited this debate of, well, how old are Saturn's moons? For the longest time, we've thought that Saturn's moons formed at the same time as Saturn itself. So again, four and a half billion years. <laughs> Excuse me, but some dynamical modeling has suggested that these moons could also be as young as 100 million years old. So this has, this has just launched a whole, whole sub-discipline look at these ages and is, is the key question that I'm, that I'm looking at answering with some of my work. And a way to get at the ages of a planetary surface is to look at the cratering record of it because the craters, the craters record what has happened to this object. If there's less craters on a surface, we can tell that something has happened to erase those craters like the Lunar Maria, but these, these surfaces are all heavily cratered. So we're, we're looking at really what has happened to these moons since they've been around. So we're looking at Tethys in particular because Mimas doesn't have as high enough resolution images as I want to do the crater counting. And Enceladus is too active right now. Enceladus is, like I mentioned earlier, is just erupting out of its south polar drain pretty constantly. So you're, it's erasing a lot of smaller craters across the satellite, not just near the South Pole. And so Tethys, the next moon out, was a, was a good choice to start at since we have the image data we, that we want and we have, and we don't really have an active world. And so Tethys itself is really well known for this impact base in Odysseus, which is around 450 kilometers and this canyon system Ithaca Chasma, which takes up a canyon system here, which takes up a, a majority, a pretty large size of planet's surface. And so to, to give you background, what, what is creating these craters on, these, on the planets? The inner solar system has mostly been created, cratered by different asteroids. And we can tell the ages of these units based on return samples, like from, from the Apollo era and, and other meteorites. But the outer planets, they've been cratered by a different source. They've often been cratered by comets and sometimes debris that's been orbiting the giant planets themselves. And the ages are not well constrained. The, if you try to take the interplanetary, interplanet chronology and bring it out to the outer planets, it really, it doesn't work. Be, because these, giant, these outer planets are being cratered by different, different impactors, which have different rates over time that they hit these planets with. So this is, this is really, this, this is the, the tricky thing about getting these ages is we need to know what happened with the impactor sources themselves, and the craters can tell us that. So at Saturn in particular, the two main sources I'm looking at are sun orbiting debris called heliocentric, and these are more or less your comets that they could come from really any direction in space. And then I'm also looking at this planetocentric component. So this is debris that is, that is orbiting Saturn and is often kind of with, 
within Saturn's ring plane and would likely impact things that are in Saturn's equator, like the satellites. And, before, and just to set, set up a bit of a background for the, for the crater counts themselves, I have an example of cumulative size frequency distribution with an example planetary surface to give just to just to make sh make sure that we're all on the same page with what the plots I'll later be showing are actually saying. So if you have a cratered surface that's that's only weakly cratered, like with this four crater example here, you plot you plot a curve that's pretty low, and the y-axis is showing just how many craters there are in this area that you've counted, based and then plotted against the diameter of the crater themselves. And if you add craters to that surface, you, you, put, you push the curve up because there's more craters per unit area. So this lower, lower density of craters, we say that's the younger terrain, so it's been exposed, exposed to those, the wilds of space for less time, so has had just less time to accumulate craters. And the higher up something is on the plot, the older the terrain is. And, and this dashed line, represents what we call a production function. So this is a function that describes how, how a planetary surface has been hit over time. So there's, for the outer planets, there's a general two types of production functions that are describing the sun orbiting debris and this, and this giant planet orbiting debris. And so that, that can be reduced down to a slope that we can fit the data to see, does our crater, do our crater counts match along with this function? So what do we need to date these satellites? <laughs> we need to know what the, what the impact crater size frequency distribution looks like. And we need to know what the, what the distribution of the impact of sizes and their velocities are. And ideally, we'd love to return samples that have been age dated in a lab. <laughs> but so we have this work is taking a look at that for the crater size frequency distribution. And we're starting to get a look at the impactor sizes and, and velocities because you can scale from the crater diameter up to the size of the thing that made the crater. But that's, again, that's another talk. <laughs> and what we also want to look at is, is this debris from a heliocentric or a planetocentric source? Because if it's from a heliocentric source, we can, we can possibly model better when this debris could have been hitting the surface, whereas a planetocentric impactor source really could have hit these moons at any time and is, is a bit harder to constrain. And we, we, we don't have return samples. I, I'd love to get return samples from an icy satellite, but I'm not, I don't know how we would even do that. <laughs> and so the, the, big, the really big questions that I'm looking at answering with this work is what are the main sources of impactors at the Saturn system and that are creating these craters? And what fraction, what fraction of them are sun orbiting or Saturn orbiting? And really broadly, what are the ages of these inner Saturnian satellites? So here I have a map, the, the, the same map of, of Tethys earlier, just overprinted with the maps that I've, that I've generated. So I have a region near, near the basin. Regions two, three, and five are near Ithaca Chasma. So region five itself actually lies along this canyon system. And region four is roughly on the opposite side of the planet from this impact basin, which is, which is a location where we could see, see effects of of this big impact event, like you could get more debris that's creating craters on that side. This isn't exactly anecdotal, but it was the best we could do with the image coverage. <laughs> so now here is an example, an example of one of the craters, crater maps that I've created. So this is all image data from the Cassini narrow angle camera, and this is a mosaic that I've that I've processed myself, done all the mosaicing, and then here is the crater map. So we. I went into to this map, counted all the craters, drew them, measured their diameters, their locations, all that great, all that great data, and we classified them into these morpho morphologic categories. So a circular crater is just our prototypical crater, just nice and circular in, in size. It's a nice good little crater. And elliptical craters are are just that. Like they they are a crater that is not circular and has one axis that is longer than the other. And polygonal craters are ones that just, they're not circular. They often have straight rim segments that are making sort of a 90 degree angle between them. Like if you go up to Meteor Crater near Flagstaff, Meteor Crater is actually a really great example of a polygonal crater since it formed along zones of pre-existing weakness in the faulting area. And then, 
irregular crater irregular craters are just that they didn't they didn't fit into the circular domain they didn't fit into the elliptical and they didn't fit into the polygonal so they have their own thing and connected craters are groups of craters that share at least a portion of their rim likely craters are those that i i could see them like you know they're they're like they're pretty i'm pretty sure they're crater but the but the lighting angles of the images were less ideal to confirm that yes this is absolutely a crater so they get their own category and then the ejective blanket is just material that has been pushed out of the crater during the crater formation stage and just left on the surface so that was over here i determined it based on like an appearance of of softened terrain relative to the rest of the area so here, here are the same size frequency distributions. No, the data is not nearly as nice <laughs> as the cartoon, but A shows all five of my regions, and and re right away in the small diameters between one to like two kilometers, region one pops out right away as plotting higher. So we we've been interpreting region one just to be slightly the relative oldest terrain unit, and then regions three, four, and five are plotting semi close to each other. And so their ages are likely and in, in, are similar, relatively speaking. And region two is plotting still lower. So we're, we've interpreted this to be like the youngest terrain unit, but it, we don't have exact ages yet. <laughs> but region, if you look on C, we have a break and a slope here, which is usually telling us that there's been some sort of crater erasure or difference in impact or population. And this, this region five overlaid that same tectonic system. <laughs> so maybe it's maybe that change in slope is related to the tectonics. We're not 100% sure yet, but still an area of open investigation that we can look at. And so overall, I counted nearly 4,000 craters to get this data set. And there are still more craters in my future work. <laughs> so going to this question of the production functions. Thanks, Ariel. The I'm plotting this this production function from Zon, Zonley et al. 2003. They describe a heliocentric source as their case A scenario, and this is I have this plotted in the purple dashed line, and it can fit pretty well at the small smaller diameters, but it really does not match the data well at large diameters at all. <laughs> and then I plot this planetocentric debris, which was actually determined based on crater counts at Neptune's Moon and Triton to to the data, and between four to seven kilometers on all the satellites, they they match fairly well for the most part. But there's still no one function that perfectly is describing this impact or source here, at at, at least at that base. So we've been drawing the conclusion that none of the currently predicted functions fit well with the observed crater record on Tethys. So right now we're finding that a significant contribution, a significant component of the crater record was caused by planetocentric debris, and that it's more of a unique population to the Saturn system and not, not what was described at Neptune, as you could possibly imagine, what the bombardment environment at Neptune is drastically different than what is happening at the Saturn system. And so this is purely unique to, to the Saturnian satellites. But knowledge of what this, this planetocentric population looks like is still sparse. It needs it needs more dynamical modeling to really get at what's going on with it. But what's also important to know is we haven't yet ruled out this old moon or young moon scenario or, or determined what fraction of heliocentric and planetocentric the craters were, but it's still ongoing to try and get at that even more. And to do this, I'll be doing a similar study on Saturn's moon Dione and, and looking at the elliptical craters and their orientations across the mid-sized satellites because those elliptical craters can potentially give us information about the percentage of, of these craters that were actually made by planetocentric debris. So I wanna wrap that up and thank the, thank the committee again for inviting me and, and thank the funding sources and my committee. And we'll take any questions. Thank you. Thank you for a very nice talk. Important stuff. Um, and you can also feel the applause building in the chat. Uh, <laughs> questions, we have, time for, we have time for one or two quick questions. Uh, Carver Beerson asks, have you compared the Singer et al. Cratering, rec crater records, sorry, cratering records for Pluto? And he says he's excited to see the Dione results. Oh, that's, a, that's a great question. I, I, I did compare mine to her data and 
the data they're finding at Pluto actually matches very nicely with a heliocentric impact or source, as does when they compare it to Jupiter. So my 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 craters do plot very differently from where from where the Pluto system shows up, but it's even more more strong, more evidence that there there is something unique happening here at Saturn. And yeah, they stay tuned for for my defense at some point where the Dione results will be discussed. <laughs> Great. Are there any other questions? We have time for maybe one more. Somebody has a quick one. We are at 4.30. Uh, okay, there's a question in the chat. Uh, this will be the last one. Lee Bernard asks, uh, I noticed the crater density falls off for smaller craters. Why is this? So it, it could be because these craters can be erased more frequently from from the surface if other craters are created. So when you create an, a crater, you launch a bunch of debris that could more easily erase these smaller craters. But there, there's, that's just one scenario for it. There's, I, I try to take out things, craters that could be from other, created from other impacts. So that's a secondary crater. And maybe that could be a result of, the, of that fallout, but it's, there's quite there's a bit going on there. <laughs> All right. Well, great. Well, thank you very much, Sierra, and thank you, uh, thank you. Emily and Ren too. Those were those were all great presentations. Thank you very very much for volunteering to do this. I know it's a little stressful, but hopefully it was kind of fun <laughs> in its own way, and yeah. and very useful. And certainly, I think we all we all learned a lot. So, so thank you very very much, and uh, look forward to seeing everybody next week. Uh, when our speaker will be uh, Christian Finlator from uh, University of New Mexico talking about linking galaxy formation with cosmic reionization. So we go way out into space. So, um, and back in time. So thanks everybody and uh, see you next week. <laughs>